Rhino horn, more valuable than gold. An animal with a staff of gold of five, six kilograms running onto his head. Rhino horn is now the most valuable illegal product on the planet. Billions of dollars sold annually on the black market. And to satisfy that insatiable demand, rhinos are being killed for their horns. Their faces are hacked and mauled. Tens of thousands of poached rhino just over the last decade. We are close to the point of no return. Are sliding down the hill towards extinction. If we do nothing, rhinos will vanish from the earth. We will lose the species. We don't want to be the generation that said we've done too little too late and there's no rhino left. I traveled to South Africa to see what's being done to help save the rhino. It is a multi-layered, multicultural approach that's using every advantage it can find and some that may surprise you. We will show you the gruesome side of wildlife poaching, but then we'll build you right back up and give you hope, hope for the future of the rhino. Hello and welcome to our special presentation of Down to Earth, the Extinction Crisis. I'm Dagmar Midcap. Exotic wild animals, they grasp and they hold your attention. Their striking size, their flamboyant colors and iconic features, they are truly mesmerizing. Unfortunately, many of these creatures are now facing destruction for those self-same hallmark features that we so greatly value in living beings. The exotic animal trade is a massive criminal enterprise that generates over $10 billion annually on the black market. Powerful crime syndicates are the primary drivers behind the international wildlife trade. In recent years, rhino horn has surged to the forefront of this global atrocity. A single rhino horn can be worth as much as a million dollars on the black market. The demand is fueled, is fueled by Asian markets, where it's viewed as a status symbol and mistakenly believed to provide medicinal value for ailments ranging from cancer to HIV and AIDS. In reality, rhino horn is composed of keratin, the same material as a human fingernail, and contains no medicinal properties. At the beginning of the 20th century, rhinos numbered over a half a million animals worldwide. Today, fewer than 25,000 remain on Earth. In South Africa alone, three rhinos are killed each day. If this alarming trend continues, none of the five remaining species of rhino will survive. Those figures are obviously, apart from being completely devastating to us, they are unsustainable. Um, we are losing more than we can breed. This horn is actually worthless. It's, it's worth nothing, but it's worth millions. How do you explain that to somebody? To us on the ground that see these animals and the value of their life form to be brutally murdered for a piece of horn that's worth nothing. I can't understand that it's actually that, we, that they're just killing these animals for nothing, that we don't see the value in it. One of the hardest hit regions in the battle against poaching is South Africa. I recently spent 10 days there on the front lines, getting a first-hand look at what's being done to help protect endangered species. It is a complicated and a multifaceted approach, but the primary method of protection is found in anti-poaching wildlife units. They are known as rhino rangers. They are the first line of defense, boots on the ground security to protect rhinos. And as you can see, these anti-poaching rangers are armed with weapons. The hot spot for poaching is Kruger National Park in the northeastern region of South Africa. Greater Kruger Park extends to the borders of Hootsbride, where I spent two days in the bush with a rhino ranger unit. You can see they act, this one was all hacked off with an axe except for that one. You can see the part of the cartridge of the nose bone is all hacked off. So some of these rhinos are actually still alive when they hack them off and they even hack off a piece of the skull. Rhino rangers are first on the scene to witness the destruction and devastation caused by poachers. There's frustration, there's despair, there's anger just because of what's happening, because we actually are in this and we can't believe that it's actually happening to us. That anger and passion you hear in Tim Parker's voice is why he's one of hundreds of anti-poaching rangers in South Africa, putting their lives on the line to help save the rhino and fight wildlife poaching. It's escalated a lot. When it first started, it was usually a poacher with a 458 and an ax for the rhino. Now it's escalated to they have assault rifles, AK-47s, and those are for us. 
To combat well-armed, violent poachers, Rhino Rangers are expertly trained regiments, similar to soldiers. Hand-to-hand -hand combat, automatic weapons, small unit tactics, survival in harsh physical conditions, learning to live off the land for days without leaving a trace, ready for a firefight with poachers at any moment. If I get a shot, they give us the lungs and lats, and there we go. There is no time for rest, day or night. There is always a ranger in the bush. We'll stay out all night in areas where the rhino like to hang out or where poachers like to come in. So we'll set OPs, ambushes, and see if we can get contact. I got to ride along with a rhino ranger patrol and see how it's done firsthand. The first evening, we observed the Game Conservancy by off-road vehicle, looking for rhinos and any signs of poacher incursions. We even dropped off two rangers headed out on night patrol in the bush. The next day, I got a hands-on look at the detailed training that they undertake with automatic weapons. Then it was time to track a crash of rhinos. Following the lead of a ranger named Vusi, we started at the watering hole. This rhino track and this one. We tracked the footprints through miles and miles of bush. Finally, we came across the crash. Four rhinos alive and well, safe in the wild, with no poachers in sight. There would be no firefights with poachers this day and no dead rhinos. So the anti-poaching unit did their job. This was a very good day for the men with their boots on the ground. As you just saw in that story, wild rhinos showcase horns of varying lengths. Some animals have fully grown horns, while others display little more than a stump, which is not the result of poaching. As the number of rhino lost annually began to climb, conservationists took a radical, proactive rather than a reactive approach to protection, resulting in a growing movement to cut off a rhino's horn to help ensure its survival. It's called dehorning. I got a first-hand look at this unconventional process at the Pinda Game Reserve, a privately owned wildlife shelter between Swaziland and the Indian Ocean in KwaZulu-Natal province. A helicopter overhead, jeeps on the ground, rhinos with horns running freely through the reserve. And here's how that process works. Once the helicopter team finds and selects a rhino, a highly trained wildlife vet shoots the rhino with a tranquilizer dart. The helicopter calls out the exact location and the rest of the team arrives in jeeps. And as you can see, the rhino is starting to feel the effects of the tranquilizer dart. This is a two-ton powerful animal and it takes as many as 10 people to demobilize a rhino. Using a lasso on the legs and a blindfold to reduce stimulation, they manage to get the rhino down. Now she is fully sedated, and the expert team works fast to dehorn the rhino. It's important to note that this process does not harm the rhino. She will feel nothing. Measurements are made about four fingers above the growth of the cuticle. 55. Then assistant reserve manager Dale Weppiner uses a reciprocal saw to cut the horn off. Remember, while this is happening, this animal will feel nothing. It's similar to cutting your fingernails. And in a few moments, the horn is off. So this is the horn from a southern white rhino adult female. On the black market, a horn like this, two to three kilograms, worth anywhere from 60 to $100,000 US per kilogram. Next, they use a horse hoof trimmer and round off what's left of the horn. Throughout the entire process, the rhino is being monitored by a team of medical experts. They also take DNA and microchip the rhino. On this particular day, that job fell to me. Okay, ready? Okay. There you go. That's perfect. Wow. I just microchipped a southern white rhino, and that's going to ensure that we're able to monitor her after this dehorning procedure, and we'll be able to make sure she stays happy, healthy, and most importantly, alive. This whole process takes about 20 minutes from start to finish, and finally, the blindfold is removed and then the rhino starts to come out of her sedation. After a few stumbles, the dehorned rhino regains her footing and trots off 
pretty much like nothing ever happened. If you're wondering, this type of unconventional intervention does carry a slight risk for the rhino, since a horn offers a level of protection. But scientists tell us that the effect of losing that horn is minimal for the animal, in terms of defense potential and social interaction. The conclusion? Losing a bit of personal protection is a small price to pay for protecting an entire species, now in danger of extinction. It's, it's as simple as that. Much, much rather see an animal without horns, but still living a perfectly happy life, grazing, breeding, um, interacting with other rhino as well and other animals, just as it normally would, than having to approach a, a 12 hour old, a 24 hour old carcass of an animal that's had its face hacked off, um, and possibly even while it was partly alive from a poaching incident, so definitely much better to see them without horns than, than dead. If left alone, the horn will fully regrow in 12 to 18 months. And since the onset of those dehorning procedures, the Pinda Game Reserve has seen a dramatic reduction in poacher incursions and a drastic reduction in the number of rhinos killed on its land. When we come back, baby rhinos, orphaned, after their mothers are poached. We'll see who's taking mom's place and walk alongside these young rhinos in their journey back to the wild. It's a fairy tale, um, and we don't often get these stories, but uh, when we do, we hang on to them for dear life. It really is almost too good to be true. A rhino recovery story of hope and inspiration. Down One of the many heartbreaking aspects of this extinction crisis involves the poaching of new mothers. What happens to their calves? The results vary greatly. Most do not survive as they are entirely dependent on their mothers for food and protection. But into this void step human caretakers. This unique foster system is a true lifesaver for orphaned wildlife. The devastating thing is that we actually have to be where we are today to to step in and take mom's place. Megan Ladachan is the manager of Zululand Rhino Orphanage. This is where baby rhinos come when their mom has been killed by poachers. They're extremely attached to their moms so a lot of the time you'll actually find this little baby that and he'll just be lying next to his mom's body not even going out and, and looking and trying to move around just totally attached to mom so that's how they land up finding the babies because they just lie down next to mom's dead body that traumatic experience is followed by the challenging process of bringing these baby rhinos into the orphanage there is no trust in the beginning I mean, it's us, it's this form, it's this shape that's left them in that condition in the first place. So now why do they have to trust us? And I think that's the most difficult part is, is showing them that we're actually there to support them, love them, give them what they need to get them back to where they belong. Eventually, though, through lots of love, care and food, the staff gains the trust of the orphaned rhinos. This is Toto. <laughs> Toto's very friendly. Once they do accept us, it's just incredible. And um, it's extremely rewarding. This little guy that we've just seen, he's went from 55 kilograms to 100 kilograms in two months. So you can see what a little bit of love and care and good nutrition does. <laughs> As much as these little rhinos are loved, this will not be their forever home. The rhinos remain at the orphanage until they're at an age and size when they can look after themselves in the wild. Then the orphaned rhino will be released into a reserve that is secure and protected. To, to know that you've put this animal back into its home, that is their home, that's where they belong. This is not where they belong, this is just a little temporary you know, space and we give them lots of love and care, but when they go off and they can join a little crash of rhino, meet a girlfriend or a boyfriend, make more baby rhinos, that's, you know, that is the ultimate goal. Using every tool in the toolbox. It's a common phrase spoken by those on the ground working to help save wildlife. Basically, they will try anything that might help. And I got a look at a new and innovative anti-poaching program that's gaining some traction.
For the safety of the rhinos and the rangers involved, we cannot specify the exact location. But we can tell you that this reserve spends roughly $300,000 a year on security. The war against poaching is being fought on many levels. First, humans protecting animals, and now, a very interesting way, animals protecting animals. We have got a mounted unit here, which we've just started up fairly recently. This is an equine anti-poaching unit. Mounted armed rangers using hoofs on the ground to patrol for poachers. Two of the bigger and more obvious advantages, mobility, easier to cross the train than in a jeep, and visibility, you can see up high over some of the shorter bushes. You have a, a nice height advantage for tracking and also for kind of viewing over the horizon. You're very quiet compared to a vehicle, so you're much more in touch with your surroundings. And speaking of the surroundings, training the rangers to ride horses has been difficult, but training the horses has been even more difficult. After all, horses are not used to seeing huge, exotic animals without being easily spooked. It's very satisfying to see how relaxed the horses are now with the game compared to the first time they saw it. Imagine you kind of think you know the deal with life and then you see a giraffe for the first time. It's a bit of a shock. Um, so seeing how relaxed they are now is fantastic. Another animal that's getting into the protection business are dogs. Canine protection units use German shepherds and bloodhounds. After arriving on a rhino crime scene, bloodhounds track scents hoping to find evidence that could lead to the capture and prosecution of a poacher. Attack dogs are used when rangers are actively engaged with poachers. Then you would use your attack dogs to track a hot scent, a scent that's very fresh, and you'll carry on tracking them until they have visual of the suspect. You'll ask the suspect to stop and surrender and drop his weapon. If he doesn't comply, if he's aggressive or he takes any action against you, the dogs are trained not to kill or um, seriously injure people, but they're trained to go for the arm or for the leg just to subdue the suspect so that the anti-poaching officers can move in and then make the arrest. Using animals to save animals speaks to just how critical this situation has become. We are at that point. We've come to that stage where we have to do these extreme things and everybody is finding their niche and pulling in their own direction to try and do everything we can to, to save this situation. Because if we don't, if we don't do it now, we're going to lose this battle and that would just be a disaster. While security is a here and now way to protect the rhino, the long-term answer may very well be education, helping children in African communities to see the value in wildlife. It will instill a desire to protect the species moving forward. This is Nourish, a community center and preschool serving children from poor villages. Sarah Bergs runs Nourish entirely on donations. The children here learn English and life skills so they can succeed and uplift their communities. The hope is that through education, these kids can learn the value of environmental integrity and species conservation, concepts that are often missing in places where wildlife poaching gains traction. They are important tools in the long-term approach to saving rhinos and other wildlife. Coming up next on Down to Earth, the extinction crisis. Clinging to life, Tandy was found bleeding out, dehorned. But against all odds, today she thrives. We will hear from the man who helped save her life and the surprising twist that Tandy's life has since taken. Down. As the funding and weapons provided to the poachers increases, rhino protection units are also forced to keep up with that pace. One of the advantages of protection units is the ability to get above the bush. Game reserves are expansive areas of land. Small planes are allowing rangers to cover vast territories and gain visuals on rhinos and poacher incursions. More recently, drones have also come into play. Drones are a cheaper and easier way of achieving those same beneficial results. Poachers often operate under the cover of complete darkness. And recently, reserves have begun using thermal technology to combat nighttime poaching. These thermal cameras can monitor rhinos and fence lines in complete darkness. Rhino protection turning high-tech 
just to give wildlife a chance. Across Africa, the slaughtering of rhinos has resulted in great despair. But sometimes, from those darkest of places, comes a story that gives you hope, inspiration, and even a surprise or two. Kariga Game Reserve in 2012. Three rhinos poached in one night. Two died. One, a female named Tandy, was found in a pool of blood clinging to life. A huge trauma to her face. She had a, a hole in her head this size where both her horns were removed and then right down into the sinus cavities in her skull. Uh, these incredibly deep cuts. Dr. Will Folds was one of the first on site. He was shaken by the brutality of the crime. I really did not think she would live through that. Uh, that's how bad things were. Dr. Folds, working with a team of experts, performed over 20 surgeries on Tandy through months of recovery. We could see there was something amazing about this animal, that she really wanted to live. And it was that tenacity, I think, that has pulled her through and made her into such an amazing story. An amazing comeback story indeed. This is Tandy today. And as you can see, she's not only alive, but she's got some company. Those with her are Tandy's two calves. The first baby, Tambi, was born in 2015. The second baby, Colin, was born in 2017. On our visit to Kariga, an amazing moment as Tandy and her calves came within just a few yards of us. This is the closest they've ever been to a camera crew. When I look at uh, us as human beings have subjected her to and yet how trusting she has become of us again, uh, it's, f it's truly a, a phenomenal to see that uh, uh, relationship that she has with us and this degree of, of faith and trust in us. So all those stories that we just showed you, the way the humans are banding together to protect the animals, the way the animals are protecting the animals, success stories result from those efforts. And Tandy and her two calves is a huge one of those conservation success stories. She's a, a living symbol of this trauma that poaching uh, induces on a species like this. And yet through that, against all these odds, she's managed to survive come through it so well and is now contributing to her species, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fairy tale. Um, and we don't often get these stories, but uh, when we do, we hang on to them for dear life. Inspiration grows from these stories of hope. Inspiration that we hope will propel you to help make a difference. Coming up, we'll show you how you can get involved and we'll find out if all these anti-poaching efforts are actually making a difference. Throughout this show, you may have seen Mike Veal. He's a rhino ranger from San Diego who splits his time here and on the front lines in Africa. His foundation, Global Conservation Force, outfits rangers with the equipment and training they need. He planned our entire journey and kept us safe. So a big thank you to Mike. In the past half hour, we've seen numerous ways people are helping to protect wildlife. So are these tactics working? The short answer is yes. In the last two years, the rate of successful rhino poaching has decreased. And this positive step is a direct result of varying and increased efforts to save the species. But now is not the time to rest. It is truly a global crisis, so how can we help? If you're interested, please go to NBC7.com and search rhinos. There you'll find a series of links to conservation organizations making a difference. Remember, this is not just an African continent problem. We all need to join together to help counter the global wildlife trade. Thank you to everyone from San Diego to Africa who helped make this show possible. And thank you for watching Down to Earth, The Extinction Crisis.